Number 4. Southern KS-1 number 722. The American Southern Railway's KS-1s are among the most famous and beloved consolidation types in the world, of which over 400 were built between 1903 and 1909 by Alco and Baldwin. 722 was manufactured by Baldwin in September of 1904 to pull logging trains on the Southern's Murphy branch between Asheville and Murphy, North Carolina. But instead of being sent for scrap following its initial withdrawal from service in August of 1952, it and sister locomotive 630 were sold to the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad the following November. Upon being purchased by the ET and WNC, 630 and 722 were renumbered to 207 and 208 and had their coal bunkers shaved down to increase visibility for numerous reverse operations and switching. They served the ET and WNC until being traded back to the Southern for two former Central of Georgia Alco RS3s in December of 1967 to participate in the newly formed Southern Steam Program. Both engines were reverted back to their original form and serviced, with 630 entering first in 1968, while 722 needed major repairs to its cracked firebox and didn't enter until 1970. Upon entering excursion service, the 722, much like Mikado number 4501, was repainted in the Southern's Virginian green with gold linings paint scheme used for passenger locomotives, despite never wearing it in revenue service due to never being assigned to faster service in the days of steam like the PS4s were. It also made the locomotive more distinguishable from 630. 722 would run together with 630 and 4501, as well as Savannah Atlanta number 750, during its excursion career with the Southern, and was also loaned to the Wilmington and Western Railroad in May 1979, and Chattanooga's Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum with 630 in 1980. TVRM was ultimately where the KS-1s and the 4501 were sold off to when the Southern needed larger superpower locomotives for its increasingly heavier passenger trains. Said superpower locomotives being Canadian Pacific No. 2839, Texas and Pacific 610, and Chesapeake and Ohio 2716, and later Norfolk and Western 1218 and 611. 722 continued running at the TVRM with 630 and 4501, until its boiler certificate expired in November of 1985. After sitting on display at the TVRM's Grand Junction, the Southern successor, Norfolk Southern, who for some reason still owns 722, moved it to a park in Asheville, North Carolina in 1992. The KS-1 was then moved into storage at a roundhouse in Asheville in 1999, when Norfolk Southern sold off the property its display was located at, so they could redevelop it. 722 was then purchased by the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad, or GSMR, which operates on the Murphy Branch 722 ran on in revenue service in late 2000 with plans to refurbish the KS-1 to operational condition with their S-160 number 1702. Tragically, the plan fell through when 1702 was taken out of service in 2004. By that time, 722 was already disassembled outside the shops and exposed to the elements. 1702 was finally returned to service in 2016, but 722, meanwhile, has been sitting outside the shops, disassembled for almost two decades with little maintenance, all while exposed to the elements. Time has taken its toll on the unfortunate KS-1. The estimated cost of refurbishing 722 is currently around $700,000. But right now, the 722's future is uncertain and questionable, along with whether it will remain green or not when reassembled and or ever restored. In the meantime, 630 and 4501 are still operational at TVRM. I've been there once, which happened in May of 2019, during which I got to see both locomotives in person and even watch 630 move under its own power. It's still the only time I've ever seen an operational standard gauge steam locomotive move under its own power in person. This is a bit of a fraction of why 722 made it into my top four.
Number 3. The Retired Reading T1s. I might be one of, if not the first, to discuss these locomotives after 2102's return to steam in April of 2022. The Reading's T1s are the most famous locomotives used by the railroad, but they were not originally 484 Northerns, but instead 30 of their I-10SA consolidations, of which 50 were built by Baldwin in 1923, number 2000-2049. to 2049. When World War II was coming to a close, the Reading needed a locomotive that was more powerful than their Mikados and faster than their Santa Fe types. A similar situation that the Pierre Marquette faced before the war in the late 1930s that resulted in their famous N-Series Berkshires in 1937. But unlike the Pierre Marquette, the Reading was in that situation during World War II, and the War Production Board thus denied them from building new locomotives, but permitted them to modify or rebuild existing locomotives. And so, the Reading rebuilt 30 of the I-10SAs into what became the T-1 Northerns in their steam shops and had them renumbered to 2100 to 2129. Upgrades consisted of larger six-axle tenders, fireboxes designed to burn low-quality anthracite coal, and 70-inch drivers, among others. The T-1's primary assignments were mostly pulling freight trains. Initially, Five T1s were kept following the end of revenue steam on the Reading, with said fifth being number 2123. In 1959, the Reading began running a series of Iron Horse Ramble excursions across its system using 2100 and 2124, with 2101 as backup, and 2123 being used as a donor locomotive. That T1 was over time cannibalized to death and scrapped in 1966. Rest in peace. 2124 was the first of the T1s to be retired from excursion service when its flu time expired in October of 1961, and replaced by 2102. It was then sold to F. Nelson Blount and moved to Steamtown the next year. The locomotive and the rest of the collection are now on display in Scranton, Pennsylvania. When the Reading Steam Program came to an end in 1964, 2101 and 2100 were sold to the Strigel Scrapyard in Baltimore, Maryland in September of 1967. Both T-Hogs were eventually purchased in 1975 by, you guessed it, Mr. Ross Rowland to be used for his upcoming American Freedom Train project to commemorate America's bicentennial. While 2100 was kept as a donor locomotive, 2101 was refurbished all the way through to operational condition in an incredibly fast period of just 30 days. It was also repainted and renumbered as American Freedom Train No. 1 and fitted with flying number boards during that restoration. One spent the next several months hauling the Freedom Train across the eastern section of the United States, until it handed the train over to the also recently restored Southern Pacific GS4 No. 4449, also known as the Daylight. When the Freedom Train tour came to an end in 1977, the T-Hog was renumbered back to 2101 and repainted in a Chessy system paint scheme for the Chessy Steam Special to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, America's first major railroad, which was now part of the Chessy system. The then Chessy 2101 spent the next two years touring the Chessy system, hauling a stylish passenger train to meet its paint scheme. But in 1979, 2101's excursion career came to a crashing end when a roundhouse in Russell, Kentucky, where it was being stored, caught fire and burned down on top of the locomotive, crippling it. It was only made worse by the fact that 2101 was involved in a catastrophic derailment on July the 28th of 1949, making the roundhouse fire its second accident. The damage done to 2101 was so bad that Ross Rowland traded it to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in exchange for Chesapeake and Ohio 614. 
2101 was cosmetically restored as American Freedom Train No. 1 and has remained on display at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in this livery ever since. Meanwhile, 2100 swapped tenders with 2101 following the Roundhouse fire and was stored at the former Western Maryland Roundhouse in Hagerstown, Maryland until 1988, when it was bought by the 2100 Corporation, led by Richard Kuhn, who was the owner and CEO of Lionel Trains at the time, and restored again in 1989. But after a brief time, it was donated to the Portage Area Regional Transportation Authority, then auctioned off to Jerry Joe Jacobson of the Ohio Central, and eventually to Thomas Paine in 1998. Mr. Paine took the 2100 to the former New York Central St. Thomas shop in the Canadian province of Ontario to be restored. But in the process, he ruined its heritage by misconverting it to burn oil, among other minor details. No! The oil conversion was the biggest mistake, as it messed up the engine's performance horribly, and also made the whistle sound atrocious, terrible as all living heck, thanks to him doing it incorrectly. What the frick, dude? You've mistreated a running steam locomotive! They're not supposed to burn oil. You've ruined it. But the plans to run 2100 fell through, and it was transferred to the Golden Pacific Railroad in 2007. Following two horrible operating seasons, 2100 was retired again in 2008, when the Golden Pacific closed, and placed into storage, exposed to the elements. She was eventually moved to a former Baltimore and Ohio roundhouse in Cleveland, Ohio by the American Steam Railroad Preservation Association in 2015 with the intention of refurbishing the 2100 to operational condition again. Plans include to revert the locomotive back to burning anthracite coal and to its redding paint scheme and lettering. Safe to say that 2100 will be back in service within a few years, along with 2102 even if 2124 and 2101 may never run again. And again, congratulations to the Reading and Northern for finishing the restoration of 2102. You deserve this. Even with 2102 back in action and 2100 on the way to return, the Reading's pride and joy still stand strong in the bottom of my top three. Number two. Norfolk and Western, Class A, number 1218. This one will definitely cause some chaos in the comments section below at the moment. The 2664 wheel arrangement is one of the rarest wheel arrangements to ever exist, with just a grand total of 56 ever built in the world for just four American railroads. The most famous and numerous of them is the Norfolk and Western's Class A of which 43 were built in its Roanoke shops between 1936 and 1950. These simple articulates were mostly used for hauling slow, heavy, as well as fast freight trains, and were incredibly powerful with attractive effort of 114,000 pounds generating 5,400 horsepower, capable of hauling 13,500 tons of freight between Williamson, West Virginia and Portsmouth, Ohio at speeds up to 42 miles per hour, or over 67 kilometers an hour, and even 14,500 in the Canova District. They even sometimes hauled heavy passenger trains that were too heavy for the smaller J-Class 484s at speeds up to 70 miles an hour. They sure put other slightly longer locomotives like the Alleghenies and Challengers to shame in these aspects. The A's served proudly with the Norfolk and Western until being replaced by diesels and withdrawn between 1958 and 1959 and scrapped, with the exception of the 19th locomotive, 1218 which was finished on June the 2nd of 1943. 
When retired in 1959, the 1218 was sold to the Union Carbide Corporation's chemical plant in Charleston, West Virginia to be used as a stationary boiler instead of being sent to be scrapped. Not only did this decision allow the 1218 to become the sole surviving A, but also the only surviving 2664 locomotive in the world, which it still holds the title of to this day. Then in 1965, the 1218 was purchased by the legend F. Nelson Blount and moved to his Steamtown USA collection in Bells Falls, Vermont. But when Blount died in a plane crash in 67, the Norfolk and Western took the 1218 back to its birthplace in the Roanoke shops in 68 to be cosmetically restored and then placed on display at the Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia in 1971. The Norfolk and Western eventually merged with the Southern to form the current Norfolk Southern in 1982, and by the end of 84, decided that they needed a more powerful locomotive than even Norfolk and Western 611 for its increasingly popular steam program, which began with the Southern in 66. Norfolk Southern selected 1218 to fulfill their demands and moved the A out of the VMT on the 116th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike. They took the locomotive to the Irondale shops in Birmingham, Alabama to begin its restoration, and it was finished on January 13th of 1987. When the restoration was finished, the 1218 became the most powerful operational steam locomotive on the globe, and joined 611, among many others, in the program. 1218 spent the majority of its new career hauling excursion passenger trains and occasional freight drags on the Norfolk Southern system, the latter of which displayed its true power to the new generations of steam enthusiasts. Notable moments in 1218's career included double heading with Nickel Plate 587 to the 1989 NRHS convention in Asheville, North Carolina. The most wild of these moments happened in 1990, when it traveled all the way to St. Louis, Missouri to participate in that year's NRHS convention with Union Pacific 844, Cotton Belt 819, and Frisco 1522. That trip was the farthest away it ever traveled away from home rails, and the only time it ever went beyond the eastern side of the Mississippi River. Then in 1991, it triple-headed with 611 and Southern 4501 between Chattanooga and Ottawa, Tennessee, then finished the journey to Atlanta with 611 for the 25th anniversary of the Norfolk Southern Steam Program. When the 1991 steam season was over, the 1218 was sent back to the Irondale shops following a round trip between my hometown of Huntsville, Alabama and Chattanooga, Tennessee, for an extensive overhaul on its flues and firebox. The overhaul was also to bring 1218 to full factory fresh condition, as its first restoration brought it to mostly fresh condition. Which does explain why it needed one so soon. But, this wasn't to be. Before the overhaul could be finished in preparation for the 1996 steam season, Things began to go very wrong for the NS Steam program in 1994, following the deaths of William and his younger brother, Robert Clayton, the last presidents of the Southern and Norfolk and Western respectively, who were most responsible for the program. Major restrictions toward the route availabilities of steam locomotives, when they could run and yearly rising insurance costs from $10 million to $25 million, with another increase the following year, made things go very, very wrong. And it was only made worse following a switching accident in Lynchburg, Virginia, that derailed and damaged nine steam program passenger coaches, two of which were damaged beyond repair and scrapped. The accident ultimately resulted in Norfolk Southern ending the program in 1994, and they've never been the same ever since. At the same time all of this happened, the 1218 was disassembled inside the shops and not ready to run again. When the program ended in 1994, all that hard work now meant nothing and the 1218 was reassembled and taken back to Roanoke and stored in the Roanoke shops. The A was eventually taken out of the shops in 2001 and put back on display at the Virginia Museum of Transportation 
following a cosmetic restoration in 2003. It has remained on display here ever since. With the exception of being on display at the Roanoke Shops with 611 and Y68 2156 for its 125th anniversary in 2007, and eventually coming back in 2012, 1218 remained the most powerful steam locomotive to run in the Preservation Age until 2019 when it was dethroned by the recently refurbished big boy number 4014. When the 1218 was reassembled, there were, and still are, a lot of parts missing. Because of this, it's unlikely she will ever run again, unless somebody has the facility and money to say otherwise. It stands as a proud monument in Roanoke, to both the people who designed and built her, and who restored it back to operational condition in 1987, as well as those who witnessed its brief career with the Norfolk and Western successor, Norfolk Southern. She is a legend of steam locomotive preservation, thanks to its excursion career, and most importantly, still forever remaining the sole surviving 2664 locomotive on our planet. So, now comes the question that so many of you are probably aiming rivals at me to answer. What man-made locomotive in this world God created could top 1218, the sole surviving 2664 on this list? Well, it is so famous and legendary that any more hints would instantly spoil it way too soon. So while you try to work it out in the meantime, Let's roll out a shipload of honorable mentions.
And at long last, the number one on this remastered list of retired steam excursion locomotives from the United States of America. Union Pacific 1943 Heavy Challenger number 3985. No matter where you are from, you should have seen this one coming from the other side of America or even from across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans since the second day of the 2020s. This 4664 Simple Articulated was among 105 of the so-called Challenger types built by Alco for Union Pacific and among 65 of its second breed of Challengers designed by Otto Habelman, who also designed the Big Boys. These Challengers, known as Jobamon or Heavy Challengers, were appropriately nicknamed Big Boys Little Brother since they were both smaller and a little newer than the Big Boys while having a close resemblance. Like the NNWA class, they were capable of hauling both enormous fast and heavy freight trains, as well as heavy passenger trains too heavy for the FBF Northerns, the latter of which at speeds up to 70 miles per hour. Although not as powerful as the A's, they were still a vicious force to be reckoned with, and were one of, if not the most versatile articulated in North America even serving as bankers in their twilight years when diesels took over. They also saw a great service working hand in hand like brothers with the big boys, and some were even assigned to passenger service and given the railroad's Greyhound paint scheme. 3985 was among 25 Challengers delivered to Union Pacific from Alco in 1943, also known as its second Heavy Challenger Batch and fourth Challenger Batch, designated 4664-4. Like most Union Pacific Challengers, 3985 was only assigned to freight trains hauling heavy loads over the steep grades of Wyoming's Sherman Hill and Utah's Wasatch Mountains as well as the entire Union Pacific system. Its last revenue run happened in 1957, followed by its official retirement in 1962. But instead of being sent for scrap like its siblings, 3985 was stored in the Cheyenne Roundhouse with Big Boy 4023 as backup power in case a traffic surge occurred in the event of America going to a hot war with the Soviet Union. Although the Cold War didn't end up escalating enough for the Giants to be brought back to steam, this decision saved 3985 from being scrapped. Not only that, but eventually making it not just one of two Union Pacific Challengers to be saved, the other being Sister Locomotive 3977, but among two out of the 252 Challengers ever built in the world. That's less than 0.008% of all the Challengers built that these two make up. Norfolk and Western 1218 only makes up less than 0.02% of all the 2664s built. But this is only the tip of the iceberg of why 3985 tops the A on my list. In 1974, the 4023 was removed from the roundhouse and donated to the city of Omaha, Nebraska, 
while 3985 was moved out the next year and placed on static display outside the decommissioned Cheyenne Passenger Depot. The Challenger sat undisturbed until 1979, when a group of Union Pacific employed volunteers moved it back into the roundhouse to begin a refurbishment to operational condition for excursion service alongside FEF Northern 844. When the refurbishment was finished just a staggering two years later in 1981, 3985 was now the largest and heaviest active steam locomotive in the world. And for the first six years of its new life, the most powerful active steam locomotive until 1987 when it was dethroned by Norfolk and Western 1218. But what the A was never lucky enough to outdo 3985 in was the longevity of its excursion career, which was several times longer for the Challenger. For his first excursion run in the Preservation Era, 3985 traveled with 844 to the California State Railroad Museum to attend the 1981 Rail Fair held to celebrate the museum's grand opening to the public. The duo would also return for Rail Fair 91 at CSRM, with part of the trip to the museum transporting 460-1243 on a flat car to Omaha, Nebraska, and Rail Fair 99, the latter of which saw the Challenger having to haul the 844 and their entire train all the way back to Cheyenne unassisted, as the living legend had suffered a flu failure during the event. Well before the trips to California in the 90s, though, 3985 was prone to causing landside grass fires due to the sparks and ashes bellowing out of its twin stacks caused by it still being a coal-burning locomotive, which heavily restricted where it could go. It was also not helped by a lack of infrastructure for coal-burning locomotives and oil being less expensive. The Union Pacific Steam Team solved the issue in 1990 by converting the Challenger to burn fuel oil which reduced operating and maintenance costs, eliminated the grass fire risks, and greatly expanded where it could go. Other notable moments in 3985's career included partaking in the Topeka Railroad Days at Topeka, Kansas with the recently restored Santa Fe 3751 in 1992, participating in that year's NRHS convention in San Jose, California with Southern Pacific 2472 and 4449, and running a trip over California's Cajon Pass with Union Pacific's ABA set of E9 diesels in 1994. The Challenger has also pulled off three different masquerades in its life, the first of which being the fictional Clinchfield 676 for the 50th anniversary of the former Clinchfield Railroad Santa trains in November of 1992. It did so by traveling all the way into CSX territory, originally owned by the Clinchfield, to haul the annual Santa train, a tradition started by the Clinchfield in 1942 that its successor still operate, in Virginia and Tennessee. The masquerade was the result of the Clinchfield having six of their own heavy challengers back in the Steam Age, which were initially meant for a Union Pacific, but instead delivered to the Denver and Rio Grande Western thanks to the War Production Board, and later sold to the Clinchfield after World War II. The Steam Team selected 676 because the Clinchfield's heavy challengers were single-stacked, while Union Pacific's had twin stacks, so going with 676 was a more historically accurate move. And it's really impressive these Southeastern Rails managed to handle a 500-ton locomotive like 3985 in the 1990s. Diesels had long taken over at that point, so... The following year, in 1993, it masqueraded as fallen sister locomotive 3967 for the 40th anniversary of the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club excursion of 1953, since 3967 was the locomotive used to pull the original excursion, which was the first ever Union Pacific steam excursion. For this occasion, 
3985 was fitted with elephant ear smoke deflectors just like the original 3967 was at the time of the original excursion. It would also dress up as 3967 a second time for the 50th anniversary of the original excursion in 2003. During the return trip of the 40th anniversary excursion, the Challenger was renumbered again to 3718 as a what-if scenario to what if 3985 had been converted to burn oil in the Steam Age, which is exactly what happened to 18 Challengers in 1952 and resulted in them being renumbered to 3700 to 3717 to identify them as oil-burning Challengers with 3977 becoming 3710, and 3984 becoming 3717, for example. So 3985, either way, would have been the next. It's no doubt that Big Boy's little brother was indeed the absolute king of masquerading in railroad culture. But aside from pulling countless passenger trains across Union Pacific's ever-expanding system and revisiting old stomping grounds like Sherman Hill and the Wasatch Mountains, 3985 occasionally hauled several heavy freight trains, the heaviest and most famous of which was a 143-car, 7,600-ton train of double-stacked intermodal container cars between Cheyenne, Wyoming and North Platte, Nebraska. A short clip of that run even became viral on the internet. It just shows the power of steam locomotives, especially at speeds like that. And speaking of power, while in the middle of an outing between September the 28th and October 14th of 2010, 3985 was selected to haul the Riling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus train from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Denver, Colorado where the circus was to be held to celebrate the 200th birthday of P.T. Barnum, who started the circus. That train still holds the record for being the longest and heaviest circus train to ever ride the rails and to be pulled by a steam locomotive in the 21st century. Circus trains are already a rare sight, and seeing a steam locomotive pull them nowadays is even more rare, but seeing a monster circus train being pulled by a single massive steam locomotive? That is a literal once-in-a-lifetime event. The end of that outing was also the last time 3985 ever ran under its own power. And upon returning home, the Challenger was finally pulled out of service for its much-awaited FRA-mandated 15-year overhaul. Its well-earned break finally came following almost 30 years of hard work in a row and its reign as the largest active steam locomotive was over. Steve Lee, the manager of the Union Pacific Steam Program, then retired at the end of that year, and Ed Dickens succeeded him. Upon being pulled out of service, Dickens and his crew planned to disassemble the 3985 and give it a full restoration to make it operational again. But as they began to make internal inspections and disassemble it, the Steam Team was overwhelmed with what they discovered. They found out that when 3985 was refurbished by the previous Steam Team, that although the men were employed, they were only volunteers. Because of this, the Challenger had tragically just been given a botch job in the form of repairs to its running gear and boiler to get it running again, but not the full proper restoration that it really needed. Almost three decades of countless excursion runs reaching speeds up to 75 miles per hour for extended periods of time, botch job fixes, and a few insanely heavy freight trains with no proper initial restoration had crippled the Challenger so badly that it wasn't even safe to operate anymore. Not to mention that Union Pacific fired up their steam locomotives by pumping heated steam into the boiler to fire it up much faster, but at the cost of increasing metal fatigue, instead of using the old method by just gradually boiling water in the boiler for 10 to 12 hours, which causes less fatigue. The 3985 now had a mountain of serious mechanical problems to be fixed. From the lead engine unit remaining attached to the locomotive since 1957, to a warped crown sheet, 
and worn out running gear, coupled with the feed water heater rusted beyond salvaging, among a ton more problems. The money needed to refurbish the Challenger all the way to operational condition was stacking at an expensively high $8 million. Even more expensive than what they spent on refurbishing 4014. Work could not just begin on the locomotive immediately. Union Pacific now had to invest a ton of money and manpower to get 3985 back to operation. But before they could finally raise the manpower and funds, Union Pacific soon became distracted from refurbishing the Challenger. When they became busy with getting Big Boy 4014 to their shops when work began to remove it from display in 2013, and then finally getting it to the shops in 2014. The Challenger, meanwhile, was placed into storage without its tender in one of the roundhouse's preserved stalls, which were too short for the tender to remain attached, and its tender was eventually attached behind 4014. They were then only to be distracted with needing to give the 844 another overhaul to not only keep at least one steam locomotive operational, but to also make 844 live up to its reputation of never being retired. Not to mention that 844 would have taken less time to refurbish. They then moved to getting 4014 refurbished to operational condition in time for the 150th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike, with plans to then get 3985 refurbished once 4014 was finished. And yes, they did get 4014 refurbished in time for that spectacular celebration I so wish I could have witnessed firsthand in person had it not been for, well, school. But by the time Union Pacific did, the thought of getting back to 3985 had unfortunately changed for the worse. Dickens himself, as well as his crew, and even the railroad, felt that maintaining two steam locomotives was enough for them, but three was just too much. And they already had two active steam locomotives, in the form of 844 and 4014. The Challenger's crippled condition and mountain of mechanical problems, thus high refurbishment cost, only made that stress on them worse. And so, because of this tragic chain of ill-timed unlucky mishaps, on January the 2nd of 2020, Ed Dickens announced to the world that 3985 was officially retired from active service. 4014 took its place that it once held beside the living legend. For the next two years, the crippled Challenger sat quietly and undisturbed in its stall at the Roundhouse, facing a once promising future that was now undetermined and possibly hopeless. That was until April the 28th of 2022. On that day, Union Pacific announced to the world that they were going to donate a ton of its surplus heritage equipment to the Railroading Heritage of Midwest America in Silvis, Illinois, for them to restore that equipment to be used for operational purposes in their possession on their property in their area. RHMA is a partner with the Friends of the 261 in Minnesota that runs and maintains Milwaukee Road 261. Among that equipment going to be donated are Union Pacific's E-Units, Santa Fe Type 5511, and most importantly, 3985. And this is what led me to create this remaster for my 2022 4th of July special. As of the making of this recording, which is July the 1st of 2022, the Challenger is being prepared to be moved to Silvis, with the date of delivery not yet confirmed. RHMA will also be converting 4014's tender to an oil tender. 
And once that is done, the 3985 and 4014 will get their original tenders swapped out and reunited to their respective locomotives. It's not yet been stated when the 3985's restoration will begin, nor how long it may take, but what is known is that the Challenger will be the first locomotive that the RHMA will refurbish. And thus, Big Boy's little brother will not be sleeping for very long. And even once awoken over 800 miles away from his big brother, 3985 may have a chance of running alongside him once again. And 3977, meanwhile, continues its joy at Cody Park, retaining its Greyhound livery and remaining completely exposed to the public to see and climb in all year round. Thirty-nine eighty-five may not have been as rare in wheel arrangement as Norfolk and Western 1218, but what it accomplished over its 29-year active career with the Union Pacific Steam Team absolutely storms the A and makes it a legend among steam locomotives and among the greatest and most famous in the world. The fact that this mammoth of the rails was the largest active steam locomotive in the world for a longer consecutive amount of time than other giants of the rails in North America, the absolute king of masquerading, one of which is a fallen excursion star, a source of a ton of lessons learned in steam locomotive preservation, from grass fires to how not to restore a locomotive, his insanely massive collection of outings, accomplishments, along with everything else he was used for, the very locomotive, everything about that eventually paved the way for the return of a big boy almost a decade after he went silent for the last time, and that he won't be down for much longer and be the first giant of Union Pacific to be restored by somebody other than Union Pacific, or another Class 1 railroad, will always make the 3985 my number one on my remastered list of retired steam excursion stars from the United States of America. A glorious top 11 remaster of my old shoddy top 5 version. Why 11? Because 4466 is underrated and I almost forgot to add it to the list. Happy birthday America!